Good. Did Record. you start? Yep. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for those that have gathered out here tonight, and we thank you for those that have contacted us let us know they're held up and can't make it. And we pray that you'd bless not only the teaching here, but that you would bless the um, those who watch later. We love you. We pray all these things in Christ's name, Lord. We do remember the Shoal family as they are facing this medical difficulty, Lord. We put them in your hands, knowing you'll do what's best. And we pray that you would just touch and heal, give the doctors wisdom. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So, somebody tell me. Uh, somebody tell me what you know about Esther. You know I like to start with a quiz. By the way, I am starting church tomorrow night with a quiz. A pictorial quiz. But tell me what you know about Esther. Who is Esther? Don't everybody go at one time like that. Nobody knows anything about Esther? Are you raising your hand? Okay, go ahead with it, young man. Well, it ain't a he, it's a she. So you're, you're she, we, no, the Lord doesn't have too many female prophets. She was a queen. Now, you can't answer now, you answered that one. How did she become queen? Why did she become queen? Danny's done that. Danny, you always have your hand up. So, I remember the final story of us. I just don't remember. All right, so I'm going to sit down and tell you. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, okay. So, the king was already married, and basically, um, he called for his wife. She, she refused to come. They put some things in. Now, what did he call for his wife to do? Uh, he called her to come and, and basically um, stand in front, basically be presented in front of the other princes of Persia and everything else because how beautiful she was and what she looked like. And Let and me break that out for you. Y'all understand what, I, I, the kids may not, but adults understand what belly dancing is. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't always belly dance with them little skimpy clothes on. Sometimes they belly danced with none. And so basically he asked her to present herself in such a fashion is, is what most people I've read after believe that he didn't just ask her to come and say, look how beautiful I am, but come and look how beautiful I am. And she's like, no, I ain't doing that. So he could have killed her. He just put her away, sort of. And they had a... Um, uh, basically, it sounds like to me a beauty contest from all over the kingdom. Now, bear in mind, this kingdom was the, the, the largest, greatest, biggest kingdom in the world at that time. So when people came, it was basically like a Miss Universe pageant. And Esther, this little Jewish orphan girl, won. Now, if you look up here at the key, it says the Book of Providential Care. That's what it could be called. If you look up here for the key verses... It says that it's the Romans 8.28 of the Old Testament. So then that begs me to ask you, what does Romans 8.28 say? And we know, not we think, but we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So his purpose is that all men should be saved. So those of us who have accepted that call to salvation, he said everything works together for our good. He didn't say that everything, you take the shawls right now, we're praying for them. She has a tumor in her leg. Well, the tumor is clearly not a good thing, but somehow this is going to work together in God's eternal plan for her good. You tracking? So Romans 8.28 that, that would happen to be my dad's favorite verse, so I've actually had that memorized probably since I was your age, maybe since I was his age. Um, Roman uh, Esther 4.14 is the text, the similar text in the, in the Old Testament. Uh, and when I read it, you may say, well, it's not similar, but the idea is similar. It says, now, because we have... That is not the right verse. I'm, I'm looking at, oh, I'm in Ezra 4.14. That would be why it's not the right verse, amen. Ezra and Esther, they're two books apart, but they do both start with ease. 
Here we go. Maybe I'll get it right this time. Here we go. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed, and who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. That last phrase, who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this, is the part that we're talking about is the uh, Old Testament version of Romans 8, 28, because it's for good, right? Basically, this book fits between chapter 6 and 7 of Ezra. The difference in Nehemiah and, and Ezra with Esther is Nehemiah and Ezra both returned to the homeland. Esther stayed in the foreign kingdom, in captivity, if you will. But she was married to, so had this Miss Universe pageant. She won, she married the king. Let's look at the outline, and then, and then I'm kind of going to throw it at you. The main characters are God, though he's never mentioned directly. This is the only Old Testament book where God is not mentioned directly. All right? Vashti, which is the first wife. Esther, the second wife. Xerxes, who is also called in other parts of the Bible, Ahasuerus. Okay? Mordecai and Haman. All right? Xerxes... His son was Artaxerxes, okay? It's the largest kingdom in the world at that time. The kingdom would have been uh, Shushan, the palace, would be down along the coast of the Persian Gulf, okay? Uh, at least from what I can tell, it would have been. But anyway, so Esther is the new queen. The book shows us many things, the occasion. The book shows us many things, but primarily it shows us that God cares as much for those who remained in captivity as those who returned. It shows us that we need to do what we need to do in a Christian life. God places us where he wants us, he provides for us, he preserves us, and he prevents us from things. Esther, Esther is elevated to queen. Mordecai is elevated. I'm going to tell you why Mordecai was elevated, elevated in a minute. Mordecai was Esther's uncle. So we don't know what happened to her parents. Maybe, maybe in the captivity, the parents were killed by their captors. Maybe they were killed. Well, they were 70 years in captivity, so it wouldn't make sense for them to have been killed on the way. So they were killed some kind of way while they're in captivity. Uh, Esther was spared to save her people. I'm going to get to that in just a minute. We see the providence of God. It turned trouble into triumph. It majors on the promises of God, not the evil plot. I think that's the problem right now that we face right now in the United States of America is too many of us Christians are looking at all of the evil and we're not paying attention to the providence of God that God can still turn this thing around. God can still work a work we're all just, oh, America's over. I mean, I can't tell you how many preachers I've heard in the last week say, well, this happened in Congress, so our constitutional republic is just gone. Well, now, they might be right, but the problem I have with that situation is they're looking at the problem, and they're not looking at the providential, all-powerful God that we serve, right? So... <clears throat> The theme is providence. Psalm 11 would be the key chapter in the Bible on the providence of God. The pictures and prophecies of Christ is Mordecai. He adopted Esther. He was steadfast. He was put in a place of honor. Esther put herself in a place of death for her people. She was their advocate. So even though she's a female, what she did with her life kind of represents what Christ did for us on the cross. Okay, The outline, the rise of Esther in chapters 1 and 2, the lies of Haman, chapters 3 to 5, and the prize of faith, chapters 6 to 10. A second way we could outline the book is the plot was formed in the first three. The malice of Haman down there, okay, and C. The marriage of Esther, the ministry of Mordecai, the malice of Haman. The plot was fought, the cry of Israel, the conviction of Mordecai, 
Mordecai and the confidence of Haman. Haman thinks everything is going perfect, just like the people that are trying to disavow Christianity at this moment. They think everything's going well, but they're not thinking about our God. Amen. And then you see the plot failed, the death of Haman, the decree of Ahasuerus, the deliverance of Israel, the days of Purim, and the dignity of Mordecai. All right, so now I'm going to tell you that whole book in four or five minutes. <laughs> Esther becomes king. Queen, excuse me. Esther becomes queen. Mordecai, her uncle, in essence her adopted father, found out about a plot to kill the king, and he made the king's keepers, if you will, aware of the situation. So this lowly Jew did something somewhat heroic, but definitely patriotic to his captor's country to take care of the, queen, the king, but the king never did anything for him. He didn't get a medal. He didn't get any honors. All right? So Haman is mad because... There you go. Put, the, put, put Mordecai on hold for a second. Haman's mad because Haman would be like... I don't know. Maybe like our vice president. Well, Mordecai was a Jew too, right? Mordecai was a Jew, but we ain't got there yet. Okay. So, because Mordecai is captive and he's raised his niece, Esther. But Haman is like second to the king, okay? So he's either, to put it in American terms, he's the vice president or the secretary of state or something along those lines. And everybody bows before him, right? But Jews only bow before Jehovah. So Mordecai wouldn't bow. Haman is mad. He finds out that Mordecai is a Jew. So he kind of cons the king into signing into law that on a certain day, anybody in the kingdom can just go over to the Jew next to them and kill him and take his belongings with no threat of violence. The Jew was not even allowed to defend themselves. So this is very much, Haman's plot was a lot like Hitler's plot, right? It did just go in and destroy these people and take their wealth. Okay, so let's fast forward. King can't sleep one night. He has somebody read to him the Chronicles. Very much like the book of Chronicles, it's just kind of a list of what's been going on in the country, right? And at some point in the night, they read to him the story of Mordecai saving his life. And he said, well, I missed, I missed what we did to reward him for saving my life. Oh, King live forever. We didn't do anything to, to it. You mean this man, this Jew, this captive saved my life and we didn't do anything? No, sir, I, I, there's nothing written here that we did anything to reward him for that. So, okay. So the next day, well, we'll get to the next day in a minute. So let's get to Haman. Haman's found out that Mordecai is a Jew. He's mad. He has built a gallows because he's going to hang Mordecai publicly on this particular day. He's conned the king into passing this law. So the next day, Haman comes in, and the king asks him, if you really wanted to honor someone, how would you honor them if you were king? Now, Schuyler, he had a big head because he was sure the king was fixing to honor him. So he said, I'd put the king's robe on him. I'd put the king's ring and crown on him. I'd put him on the king's charger, the king's stallion. And I'd have somebody lead that stallion all through the streets of the capital so that everybody can know what the king thinks of this man. He said, that is a great idea. Go get Mordecai and do all of that. 
So now you've been plotting for weeks and months maybe to kill Mordecai and everybody in the country that's left that's related to him. And now you've got to haul him through the streets on the king's horse, wearing the king's ring and crown and robe and all of that. He goes home and you know, and the men in the room will understand this and the lady will probably be mad at me. But you know, sometimes wives can be a blessing because they point out all the negative. You know, and he goes home and his wife said, they can hang you on your own gallows, buddy. You done messed up. And uh, so the next day, um, or I don't know if it's the next day, and Mordecai goes and talks to Esther and Esther is afraid because she's been in there, she's got her own house, right? Uh, the, the, the marriage with a king, at least with the Babylonian king, uh, a Persian king, whatever he was, um, it wasn't like a marriage today. The, the king and the queen didn't sleep in the same, same room. He called her when he wanted her, okay? And when Mordecai said, you need to go plead for your people, she said, but he hasn't asked for me. I could die. If I go in to see the king and he doesn't want to see me, all he has to do is not point his scepter at me and I die. Who knows but thou art coming to the kingdom for such a time as this. So she got up her nerve and she went in and she talked to the king. And the king, when she walked in the room, he pointed his scepter at her, said, boy, it's great to see you. What do you want today? I just want to make a dinner. Would you and Haman come to dinner tomorrow? Well, of course Haman and I would come to dinner. Boy, he's swole up. Boy, he's prideful. He goes in there and he, they have dinner. And at the end of the dinner, the king comes, you know, because, uh, again, I'm kind of tongue-in-cheek here, playful, but, you know, if, if, a woman goes way out of her way to do something nice, she might have something she wants you to do in return. So the, the, the king says, so what is it you want, dear? I just want you and Haman to come back tomorrow. Boy, Haman is just, I mean, his head, he can't hardly, he had to get a new hat, his head swole so big, you know. And the next day they come back and at the end of the dinner, the king's like, all right, dear, I know you want something, what do you want? just want my life. Your life? You are the king's wife. What are you talking about? Somebody has planned to kill me. Who has planned to kill you? Him. And the wife's prophecy came right. They hanged him on his own gallows. The way the laws worked in that country, if the king signed a law into being, it could not be repealed. The only thing he could do was amend it. And so he amended it and said the Jews could defend themselves. So then you have this, the, the Purim, or however you pronounce it, P-U-R-I-I-M. And since, some people say this is where our Christmas tradition of giving gifts comes from, okay? Others say it floats back to gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and it could be related to both, okay? But basically, the Jews gave gifts to one another in celebration of their survival, and their neighbors gave gifts to them basically in apology for Haman's evil plot or whatever. And that is the book of Esther in, shall we say, a nutshell. Any questions? All right, let's go to Titus, right? Titus, yeah. yeah. Well, Titus is the third book that we call a pastoral epistle, which doesn't mean that it's in the pasture. What it means is it's an older man, Paul, teaching younger men, Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, how to be pastors. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, we read the qualifications of a bishop. In Titus chapter 1, 
we're going to read the qualifications of an elder. Now, this is why a lot of people tell you that the terms are synonymous. The problem with saying that pastor, elder, and bishop are synonymous is the fact that Danny is an elder. He is not a pastor. Every pastor should be an elder, but every elder is not necessarily a pastor. An elder is a married man with children. Okay? So like uh, Roberto and Emily just got married, but he's not an elder because they don't have children. Okay? So let's look at the qualifications. A lot of people who don't, uh, you know, in the in the 21st century, if it's new, it must be right, and if it's old, it must be wrong, right? That's that that's our mentality. And so a lot of people who refuse to look back and see what others have taught and, and you know, etc. and so forth, have begun to ordain elders in every city. So they got elders and they got pastors. And I mean, there's some, there are actually some Baptist churches, I can take you to them, who have elders, deacons, and, and a pastor, a.k.a. a bishop, okay? But a little Bible study would relieve us of some of this extra stuff that we do, all right? Listen to the qualification of a bishop in 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires the good work. So I'm going to break that out for you real quick. If God calls you to the ministry, there's going to be a desire in there that you can't get away from. A wise man once said, if you can do anything but preach, do it, because you're not called if you can not preach. Jeremiah uh, got mad because nobody was listening. I mean, near as we can tell, or maybe he was sad because nobody was listening. I don't know. Either way, he decided to quit because nobody was listening. Near as we can tell, he preached 50 years and didn't have one single convert, all right? But when he quit, he said, I, I couldn't. There was a fire shut up in my bones. He had to preach. Whatever it is that God wants you to do with your life, uh, your main work, if you will, uh, should be a call. Okay? Uh, a lot of people have told me how what I should you know, tell my boys to do with their lives. I can't call my kids to preach. God has to call them to preach. I can't call your kids to preach. God has to call them to preach. Uh, we had somebody leave the church recently, and it really bothered me because their son had begun to ask me how to know if you're called to preach about two weeks before they decided to leave. Well, that's bothersome to me because God's working in his life, and somehow you get this idea that the Lord wants you to leave. Now, I can't argue with her. I can't, I'm, not, I'm not the Holy Spirit, but I don't. I find it hard to believe that the Lord was working like he was working. And, and it's hurtful to me. But back to the, the what you're supposed to do should be a calling. Have you ever thought about the fact that God calls people to be carpenters? That God calls people to be tailors? Do you know what a tailor is, Skyler? It's the person who makes clothing. Very good, sir not really a modern term so I was curious if y'all would know what that is and I'm not going to take the time to read it but in the latter book the latter chapters of is uh, of Exodus the Bible talks about two men a holy ab and Bezalel a holy ab and Bezalel and the, the Bible says that God put it in their heart not only to do certain things but to teach others how to do it and the things he put it in their heart to do was to work with wood to work with metal and believe it or not to work with cloth God not only gave them the desire and the ability, but he also gave them the desire to teach others. And so that was some other text. David said, blessed be the Lord God that teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. So he's saying God called him to be a warrior. These men, the Bible says God called them to, to be, in a sense, a, a, a seamstress as a woman. I don't know how to say that because not really making clothes. They were making curtains and stuff. But anyway, basically a clothier of some kind and, and to work with metal and wood and so forth. God called them to do that. 
So when it says, if any man desires the office of a bishop, I really believe that means God puts a desire in their heart. My, my middle boy is a, is a construction worker, and he, he intends to be a contractor, and he has such an intense desire to do this, I really believe that, that God led him to that. All right? The same thing is true for preaching, though. God puts it in your heart to do these things. So that's the first part. Now let's keep reading. A bishop then must be. Now, there's a whole list that follows this, must be. He must be, first, the husband of one wife. So no divorce. He must be vigilant. He must be sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. All of these are must be. He must be apt to teach. He must be given to hospitality. He must be, he must be, he must be. Not given to wine. No striker. So he's not he's not he's not fighting all the time. Not greedy of filthy lucre. He's not in it for the money. But patient. So he's continuing. Not a brawler. Kind of reminiscent to the to the not a striker. Alright. Uh, but co not covetous. One that ruleth his own house well, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how can he rule the church of God, the house of God? Alright? Of the, the church of God. Uh, so, there we go. He must be married. He must have children because the way he rules his house is going to be a pretty good indicator of how he will rule the church. All right? Uh, not a novice. So, it's not, not somebody who's newly saved. That's been lifted up with pride. He fall into the temptation or condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach uh, and the snare of the devil. Likewise, the deacons. And then it gives a similar set of corruption. I mean, corruptions. Of qualifications. So basically, he has to get, the, the, the pastor has to have a good report in the church and out of the church. He has to be married. He has to be apt to teach, etc. and so forth. Now turn over to Titus chapter 1. And let's look there. Titus chapter 1. You're going to find it pretty pretty similar. Look at verse 5. For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting. That right there is what, that, that, that's kind of the idea that's behind the book. It's also the key verse of the book. To set, set in order the things that are lacking. What does that mean, to set in order the things that are lacking? Jeremy, what does that mean? Uh, basically, establish standards establish what's going on and what everybody else needs to do um, exactly the church is jacked up things are out of whack nobody's following any biblical standard you need to go fix this you need to go set in order the things that are lacking now if set in order the things that are lacking and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee so people take that second part and they begin to ordain elders in addition to pastors and deacons. But if you look at it, it is, I know that there's a period there, but there is a punctuation in Greek. Mm -hmm. All right? So there's a period there, and the next sentence begins with for. In this usage, it means because a bishop must, so ordain elders in every city, if any be blameless, is that what it said about the pastor? Yes. The husband of one wife? Is that what it said about the pastor? Yes. Having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly? Is that what it said of the pastor? Yes. For a bishop must be blameless. So then he goes through, and it's the exact thing. So ordain elders in every city because a bishop must be blameless. So the, the qualifications are kind of before and after that statement. But a bishop must be blameless as the steward or servant of God. Not self-willed, not soon angry, oh me. Not given to wine, no striker. Not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality. A lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as hath been appointed that he may be able, excuse me, as hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not. You see, that's where the pastor is governing the church because 
<coughs> you can't just let anybody teach anything. You got to make sure that people are teaching biblically. Uh, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. So basically, Heraclitus is who we're talking about here. Heraclitus said, you can't trust them guys from Crete. Hmm. Right? <laughs> Nothing's changed. Doesn't mean you can't have a Bible church there, a Baptist church there. Those terms should be synonymous, right? But it means that it's going to take a little extra work because they have a culture of depravity. Which we have the same one in the United States now. The distinctive point is to dress up the doctrine, all right? To protect it, to preach it. These are the distinctive points of the pastoral epistles. So let's read these texts right here. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And verse 20, right? O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so-called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. you got to protect it. Look at 2 Timothy 4.2. I charge thee therefore, brethren. No, I guess it's, that's 4.1. 4.2. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove. Listen to these three things about preaching. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Now, I want you to help me out with this. Preach the word. What does that mean? It means to proclaim. We're talking about in church. Proclaim the word of God. Don't preach culture. Don't preach preference. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. What does that mean? Be consistent. When it's popular, when it's not. Amen. Be consistent. Reprove rebuke and exhort. I'm going to tell you what that means. That's two-thirds correction. Two-thirds of the man of God's job is to correct error. One-third of the man of God's job is to build people up. I tell you right now, one of the main reasons that we need revival, not the main reason, there are too many to count reasons why we need revival, but one of the main reasons is we have a ministry today in most churches that's maybe as much as nine-tenths encouraging and only one-tenth correction, if that, okay? Spend too much time uh, encouraging, not enough time correcting. Now, I'm going to hold on just a second, and I'm going to hit that one more time. It's okay to encourage. But our ministry has become like, it's going to hurt some feelings, especially anybody who watches this video is going to have their feelings hurt, but I'm going to tell you the truth. You ready? Our preaching in most churches in the United States of America has come to be like our public school system. How so, Brother John? Well, I just It's a comedian, okay? But comedians usually... Make fun of what? The truth. Chinese guy, he said, Chinese school, thick accent. Chinese school, very hard. Teacher, very hard. American school, very easy. Teacher, very encouraging. American student, sometimes graduate stupid. But they're very confident. And I tell you, that's what we have in churches today. We have people that are biblically illiterate and confident in their foolishness. Because the men of God have failed to obey God's plan to dress up the doctrine, to protect the doctrine, to preach the doctrine, 
and oh, amen, not just preach it. Look at Titus 2, 11 and 12. Why am I taking points from Titus from 1st and 2nd Timothy? Because 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus and Philemon are all the same, the same purpose is teaching preachers how to preach and, and direct the church and teaching people in a pew how to follow, all right? So look at 2, verses 11 and 12. Titus 2, verses 11 and 12. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Don't tell me that only certain people can be saved. The Bible says over and over and over that everybody will see the salvation of God. And if God is love, is he going to show his salvation to somebody that can't have it? Absolutely not. Luke 3, 6. All flesh shall see the salvation of God. Isaiah 54, 55, right in there. All the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of God. Revelation, out of every tribe, every kindred, every tongue. Okay? The grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. Somebody tell me how the grace of God hath appeared to all men. Tell me. Tell me some way you know that the grace of God. Because there are people on the planet that have not heard John Hallman preach, or Pete Folger preach, or John Harvey preach, or Jeremy Coleman preach. So how has the grace of God that brings salvation appeared to everybody on the planet? How have they, but if they don't know that, they've never heard that story, they've never heard anybody preach that, how has the grace of God appeared to, the Bible says the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. How has the grace of God appeared to all men? Everybody in here from you up should be able to tell me. Yes, ma'am. I believe when you see it in the light, the, the way the sun rises and sets and the water sets. Couldn't have said it better. We call that creation. The Bible says in the Old Testament that creation preaches him in every language. In the New Testament it says that the things of God are clearly seen from the creation of the world, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. In other words, you can't, I don't care if you haven't heard anybody preach, you can't say honestly that you haven't had a witness. Tell me another witness. There are three more. One more that everybody on the planet gets, Skylar. Okay, yes, but everybody on the planet is not going to be saved, so then everybody on the planet doesn't get that witness. What does everybody on the planet have? Sin. Well, that's a fact, <laughs> man. But I don't know that sin shows us the Savior. Let me help you out. Life and death. Life and death is there. I'm not quite sure how we see God in life and death, but... Uh, I'm not saying that you're wrong, but I can't put my mind on it. But I can give you chapter and verse for what I'm going to tell you. Romans chapter 2, verse 14. Romans 1, 20 is creation, the light of creation. Romans 2, 14 and 15, the light of conscience. The Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, uh, their conscience bearing them witness. So you have the light of conscience. You have the light of creation in Romans chapter 1. The light of conscience in Romans chapter 2. I can't imagine what you're going to say, but yes, Scott. The Spirit. The Spirit is in the world to convince the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. And he uses creation and conscience where they don't have the scriptures. Okay? Now, the other two witnesses, not everybody has, and that's mine and your fault. The other two witnesses. Not everybody. Everybody has the light of conscience, the light of creation. Everybody should have the light of the commandments or the scriptures. They don't, and that's our fault. Without all the technology that we have today, the Bible says a couple of three different times in the New Testament that everybody in the world heard the truth. So if somebody today hasn't heard the truth, with all the technology we have, there's a problem. So you have the light of conscience, the light of creation, the light of the commandments or the scriptures. And finally, Romans 1, 17, from faith to faith. 
So the light of a Christian. Those are the four lights. But everybody in the world has the two lights. We're talking about performing it. So let's get back to Titus. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. So not only do we preach it, not only do we protect it, but we need to perform it. They need to see it in us, okay? Uh, where did he write this book? He wrote it from Macedonia just before he went to prison. He wrote this book in about 62. It's addressed to Titus, his son in the faith. The occasion is the inconsistency, the problems in the church at Crete. And he left them there to fix it. Uh, the main words and phrases, doctrine, four times, three chapters. Good works, four times, three chapters. Uh, adorn the doctrine. What does it mean to adorn the doctrine? What does it mean? What does it mean? Uh, it's, uh, speaking to the only grown lady in the room. What does it mean to adorn yourself? On your wedding day, you adorned yourself uh, so that you would look marvelous when you walk down that aisle. How did you adorn yourself? You had something borrowed and something flew and all of those things, right? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So how do we adorn the doctrine? What? Live it. We put it on. We make it look good. We put it on. Well, it makes us look good, amen. But yes, <laughs> we put it on. <laughs> I don't think I make anything look good, but it makes us look good. All right. So the main purpose is to help various churches something like a circuit riding preacher okay you get this idea probably because i've moved all over the world in in my ministry i have actually been i'm not belly aching i'm just speaking the truth here i've actually had some people write me some nasty letters that i couldn't possibly be in god's word because i didn't go to one place and die there Now, I actually have great respect for the person in particular who wrote that letter. They went to one place and stayed there a long time. They worked with somebody who's still there. But my question to them when they wrote me the nasty letter is, I can, I can respect you for going to this one place and staying because I can see how God used you there. And God used me there. <coughs> But he also used me here. And he also used me there. And he also used me over there. And we see that in scripture. Brother Chris brought this out in his preaching. Okay. Who am I to judge you, Jeremy? To judge what God's calling you to do. You know, can I just speak frankly with what's going on in your life right now? Yeah. So... I mean, there are people, I could introduce you to preachers who would tell you it's ungodly of you to take that promotion and stay. I could introduce you to other preachers who say you'd be stupid not to take the promotion and stay. Because that promotion is going to provide you, we, we would expect, a slightly better retirement so you'd be better fitted to, to live out the rest of your days solely in the service of Christ, Right? But I can't make that decision for somebody else. I can put that decision before you so that you can look honestly at it. Because sometimes we don't see the forest for the trees, as it were. You understand? Sometimes we don't see the choices that we're making. And so it's my job as pastor to put that out there and make it clear for you to see. But I can't make that judgment for you. Paul sent Timothy excuse me, Titus, to Crete to go to all of the cities. God may call somebody else. You take Brother Harper who preached for us in December. He goes all over. One of my, one of my dearest friends 
I can't call him a close friend because we're very seldom on the same continent, let alone in the same state. But he's my dear friend, Scott Pauley. He's on a plane somewhere nearly every day. Sometimes God sends somebody to a place and says, this is your place. And then I'll tell you another thing, Danny. I'll tell you this, and then i got to shut up so you can go, and we got to finish this book and get to pneumatology. I said it right the first time. The, the, the doctrine of the Spirit. As a young preacher, sometimes we look with judgmental eyes at somebody who went somewhere and stayed even though the ministry never grew. Mm -hmm. There's a Vietnam vet I know. His name is David Tunnell. His dad, Ralph Tunnell, one of the shortest men I've ever known and yet one of the giants of ministry I've ever known. He never, his dad never pastored a church of over a hundred. To my recollection, they had a hundred one Sunday in a 50 year ministry at the same location. One Sunday. But in the early 70s, there were 10 or 12 preachers who had left that little church and gone someplace else to either start a church or pastor a church. He pastored that same church from the 40s when he came back from World War II to the 90s. He was 40 some odd years in one particular location and then he quote unquote retired but the people wouldn't let him retire so he actually left and went someplace else to pastor so that the pastor he led them to call could actually pastor the church because everybody wanted him to make decisions. Now, David himself, great guy, special forces, Vietnam, carried my sister's picture the whole time he was there. He got back, he got married, his wife tied my shoes together while I'd fall down when I was learning to walk. Her name is Gail Tunnell, if she's listening. <laughs> But David and Gail have traveled Europe several times because Gail taught history, I think, and she would bring groups over here to travel. And someplace they were, David saw a little man and 10 or 12 sheep up on the side of a hill. And boy, his old lips started quivering. He started crying, telling me about it. He said, when I saw that little old man on that hill, and it might have been a little boy, I don't remember, but I know it was just a few sheep up on the side of the hill. The Lord said, David, that's what I've called you to do. That church may not never be more than the 10 or 12 you got, but I called you to lead those sheep. You see, I can see God in that. David obviously can see God in that. I can see God in his dad, but I can see God in my dad who pastored, who, who actually swept the leaves out of a building where the church had gone extinct, if you will, and reorganized the church with the same members. They didn't have a pastor and they just quit going. They swept the leaves out of an old concrete block building and started it again. Today there's a brick building standing where that old concrete block building used to stand. Uh, he went to Mississippi and took a group of 10 people. He went to another place in Mississippi and took a group of six people. He went to another place in group Mississippi and took a group of seven or eight people. When he left those places, they were all doing better when he got there. You see, we don't know what God's called us to do. That's a rabbit trail from this circuit riding thing, but I think it's something that everybody who serve God, serves God needs to know. It's not my place to tell you what God's called you to do. Okay? Now let's finish this up. Adorning the doctrine. Paul deals with the church leaders. He speaks and teaches uh, things that become sound doctrine in chapter 2 and good works and believers in chapter 3. Uh, other remarks unto the pure all things are pure but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure even their conscience is defiled they profess that they know God but in works they deny him being abominate abominable what does that word mean Danny what does abominable mean 
Mm, yeah, it's hated some kind of way, yeah. Abominable, displeasing, disgusting. Disobedient. You notice right there, it does not say that they are lost. Now they might be. Th these verses right here could describe a lost person. But they can also describe a disobedient believer. Brandy and I were talking about counseling before. And I probably shouldn't say this on 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 the internet or whatever, but I'm going to. Most of the time when people come for counseling, they don't want to be counseled. They want you to put your stamp of approval on a decision they've already made. And a lot of times when people leave church, they don't have a good reason to leave church. They have a, a, a disobedient abominable reason for leaving but you can't tell them because they won't listen you cannot tell somebody who doesn't want to know anything in fact the Bible says there's more hope for a fool than somebody who won't listen it, now are you saying that with anger pastor no honestly I've cried over some people who've left works that I pastored because they're just being foolish but you know what? It's part of the ministry. Uh, Chris and I were talking about a particular situation that he wasn't aware of, and I didn't share any names. And he's just like, brother, you've been doing this long enough to know that's just ministry. Some folks are going to come, and they're going to go, and they're going to come again, and they're going to go again. And you just got to minister to them while they're there. It happens. So I've already told you this part right here. The pastoral epistles are a quadruplet, First and Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Any questions on that? Yeah, all right, it is 7.32, my man. Let's do pneumatology. I know that we started it, but I don't remember where we stopped, so I'm just kind of going to refresh this as we go along, all right? Okay. So... We number the Godhead, right? How do we number the Godhead? Father, Son, Holy Ghost. It's about how do we number them. That's naming them. How do we number them? I assume in that order. Yes. I'm pretty sure we can't number them, right? Because they're all one person. <laughs> that was a very wise statement, and still men do, yes. So what are the numbers? The Father is first, the Son is second, and the Holy Ghost is third, in my opinion. That, well, okay, so we're just talking about the fact that people do number them. And I'm going to tell you that that's not a biblically sound thing to do. But you just gave, first off, you gave the numbers correctly. Yeah. Second off, you gave the best explanation of those numbers that I've ever heard in my born days. We number them farthest to closest. The Father, we say, is the first part of the Godhead. The Son, we call the second part of the Godhead because He came down to us. And the Spirit, because He resides within us. Number three. That's what we say. But if, as we know in truth, the Holy Spirit, the Son, and the Father are co-equal, co-eternal, and co-existent, is there really a one, two, three? No. Exactly. But we do often refer to the Spirit as the third person of the Godhead. Tell me something the Spirit never does. Very good. That's not what I was looking for, but that is an excellent answer. She said, in case the camera didn't hear her, the Holy Spirit will never lead us astray. Skyler, you had your hand up? Well, that's kind of what your mama said, just different words. Lead us astray, lead us to sin. Yes, sir? The Holy Spirit will never do sin. 
Well, that's kind of what your brother said. So, you know, uh, y'all got that one covered. All right. The Holy Spirit never talks about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit talks about the Son. The Holy Spirit talks about the Father. But the Holy Spirit never talks about the Holy Spirit. So there's a lot of a lot of misunderstanding in some divisions of modern Christianity because it's almost like we've we've so you got two extremes with everything, right? You you realize that with everything there are two two extremes. There is the extreme. You take the husband and wife relationship. Some husbands are in charge. But they do not love their wives like Christ loved the church. Some wives are in charge. That would be the other extreme. The middle extreme is he's the head and she's the neck. And they both should be in submission to the Holy Spirit. Okay, you guys cannot wrestle right there by the phone. Thank you. Um, so Baptists I'm just, I'm just being honest here Baptists are just nearly about scared of the Holy Ghost okay and then you got other groups of people who emphasize the Holy Ghost over the Son and over the Father the Holy Ghost is important but the Holy Ghost is always going to point us to Christ alright now the only place that truth is really settled is the Word of God and the Word of God is settled in heaven We need to settle on where truth is settled, and that's in the Word of God. You can push beyond the Word of God. People do it all the time. Vody Bauckham, I, I don't agree with uh, with Brother Vody on everything, but I, I actually posted one of his quotes the other day, because you have a lot of people who go beyond. That first paragraph pretty much says what I said to you a moment ago, right? Some people overemphasize the Spirit. We as Baptists almost underemphasize the Spirit. But in defense of the overemphasis of the Spirit, or in defense of our reaction to the overemphasis of the Spirit, the Lord told me we'll never replace, thus saith the Lord, chapter and verse. Okay? My dad and his brother argued for years over this. And I can remember my uncle looking at my Bible. He's one of my best friends today. I'm looking at my dad's Bible, actually. But he said, I don't care what that says. I know what I felt. Boy, that's a problem when you put feelings before. I don't like Martin Luther. But I like one thing, at least one thing Martin Luther said. Martin Luther said something to the effect of, near as I can get it in English, feelings come and feelings go. Feelings are deceiving. I put my faith in the Word of God. Nothing else is worth believing. Okay? The personality of the Holy Spirit. We already, we've already kind of covered that. He's not an aura. He's not a force. He is part of the Godhead, the action of the Holy Spirit. He speaks. In Acts 13, 2, the Holy Spirit said, separate with me, Barnabas, all right? Uh, he intercedes. Uh, the Spirit itself make an intercession for us. He testified. The Spirit of truth shall testify. Uh, uh, he commands, Acts 16, 6 and 7, that uh, Paul was forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. He eventually went to Asia, but at that point he had not yet gone because the Holy Spirit would not suffer him to go there, all right? Uh, when he opens a door, don't try to kick it down, all right? Y'all heard about that little kid walking around the house looking for something? You didn't hear about that? No. One Sunday afternoon. You know, don't you? Daddy finally says, what you looking for? I said, I'm looking for Andy. Daddy said, who is Andy. Well, they were singing about him in church that Andy walks with me. Andy talks with me, right? And he, the Holy Spirit, is the person of God who walks with us and talks with us, right? Uh, he oversees. The Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, all right? He's talking to the pastors. He guides. The Spirit shall guide you into all truth, all right? He teaches. The Holy Ghost will teach you all things, whatsoever I've commanded you. 
uh, Jesus said. Uh, what are his reactions? Well, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. How do we grieve the Holy Spirit? What does it mean to grieve, Skyler? If somebody is grieving, what are they? Very good. So how do we make the Holy Spirit sad? Exactly. Very good. The Holy Spirit may be vexed, all right, by rebellion. They rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit, Isaiah 63. The Holy Spirit may be tempted. Uh, in, uh, in, in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira sold a piece of land and gave money to the church. There's no command to sell your land and give the money to the church. There's no command if you sell land to give money to the church how much you should give other than you should give at least a tithe of the profit on the land. But they lied to the Holy Ghost. They lied to the pastor and said, we gave it all. And the Ananias come in, gave the money. You lied to the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost killed Ananias. The wife came in sometime later looking for Ananias Peter asked her a question. She carried on Ananias' lie. And Peter said, you know what? The same fellas that carried your husband out are going to carry you out. And she died. He can be tempted. How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? The Holy Spirit may be resisted. Acts 7. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. He may be blasphemed, Mark 3, 22 to 30. He that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is more than just rejecting his convicting power. It is attributing to the Holy Ghost things. Now, there are people right now in the world that are blaspheming the Holy Ghost because they're calling what we do the works of Satan and calling the works of Satan the works of the Holy Ghost. All right? Um, you can blaspheme against deity, the Bible says, and we can be forgiven. How do we blaspheme against deity? Using his name in vain. Using his name in vain is one major way that we do that, yes. But the Bible says if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you're in trouble. You heard about the little boy shining shoes? singing songs. You ain't never heard this? It's a great story. He's popping that rag and he's singing. About the praises of God. The old guy whose shoes he signed said, Boy, don't you know there ain't no God? He said, Ooh, he, The Bible said the fool has said in his heart there is no God. Don't let it come out your foolish mouth. Let it come out your foolish mouth. There is a false assumption that only one sin will not be forgiven, not believing in Christ. This assumption is wrong because the Bible says if we blaspheme the Holy Spirit, that sin will not be forgiven. All right? There is a point of no return we could say let's talk about the attributes of the holy spirit if he's co-equal and co-eternal with god then he has the same attributes of god right he's omnipotent the holy ghost shall come upon thee the power of the highest shall overshadow thee so he's putting god the father and the holy ghost as one He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. God hath revealed them to us by the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. He's omnipresence. Whither shall I go from thy Spirit? He's eternal. Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself. He has infinite in love. Romans 15, 30. For the love of the Spirit. He's infinite in holiness. By his very name, the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost. All right? The works of the Spirit. Creation. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. All right, uh, resurrection. But if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. Regeneration, except a man be born of water and the spirit. Now, a lot of people try to make that baptism. Born of water 
Every one of us in this room right now was at one point born of water because we were in the water of our mother's womb. And when we are born again, we're born of the Spirit. All right? Uh, justification. You're justified by the Spirit of God. Transformation. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Recognition of the Holy Ghost. The Great Commission. Uh, some people call this a Trinitarian baptism. Baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. The apostolic benediction. What is a benediction? What's a benediction? Sending good and diction words, so good words. That's very good, not the word I'm looking for, but that's an excellent definition of it. Well, what is a good word that we say, Jeremy? You have a benediction, I hope, every time you eat. We have a benediction every time we have service. We say, hey, would you... Mm, mm, mm. What do I ask people to do? Yes? Bless the food. Pray. Pray. Would you open us in prayer? That is a benediction. We often have a parting benediction. What do we pray? Like if I call on Derek, what's Derek going to say? Derek is going to ask the Lord to take us safely home and bring us safely back again at the next appointed time. That is a benediction, a blessing. It is a good word. It's a blessing, all right? Goodbye is actually a benediction. What does goodbye mean? I don't want the kids to answer. I want one of you two adults to answer. What is goodbye? Okay. Basically, yeah. So it's so it's, it's like a, a farewell for now until next time. Okay, you're both right, but you're not right enough. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what it means. It's a contraction. B Y E. God be with you. We say goodbye, but originally it was good. Blessy big or good blessy ikha with blessy big with blessy ikha. God bless you. Or how do they say it in Spanish? What is you speak a little Spanish, don't you? You don't? Do you speak a little Spanish? Mm, not enough to get by. Huh. Anybody know what goodbye in Spanish is? Adios. What does adios mean? No, it does not. It means I bid you to God. A to Dios, God. How do we say goodbye in in Icelandic? I just said it to you. Good God, blessy, bless thee, you, thou, thee, if you will. Good uh, blessy ikker, God bless y'all. All right. In 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 Spanish, we either say adios. We say adios. But adios is, uh, is to God. A Dios. Or we say vaya con Dios. What does that mean? Go with God. It's basically what good blessed goodbye means go with God. Uh, in French we say adieu. I bid you adieu to God. This is a parting benediction. A blessing. Look at the blessing in Scripture. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. That is a Trinitarian benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God. So there's the Son, there's the Father, there's the Holy Ghost be with you all. Excuse me. In the challenge to the churches. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. But who spoke to the churches? Who told John to write these seven letters to the churches? Holy Spirit? No. For God? No. Paul? No. No, Jesus. Very good. Somebody's going to get it eventually. Okay, let me read it to you. Obviously, y'all are not familiar with that. 
I should bust your chops about not remembering the devotions I did for a week. But. Be careful. My memory's not so good. <laughs> <laughs> Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Write these things thou hast seen, and these things which are, the things which shall be hereafter, the mystery of the, mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, the ministers, the pastors, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write. But who is speaking? All of those letters are in red. Who's speaking? Jesus the first and the last, the Alpha, the Omega, he that was dead that is alive. Yes, Jesus. Who, where were you when you just read that? Revelation 1, 17 and following. Okay. So, and as set forth in the church's administration of gifts, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. As if we can't cover the three works that take place in salvation, and then... We will close. <clears throat> what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? <clears throat> Speaking to the adults, raise your hand if you have been baptized of the Holy Ghost. So what does that mean? It means that you are born again. That is exactly what it means because the Spirit places us in Christ. In, immersed, baptized in Christ. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is salvation. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made all to drink into one Spirit. Okay? So the baptism, we're going to go down. There's other verses. You guys have these notes. So the second thing that takes place at salvation is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth in you, and he shall be in you. Now that's way back in John 14. And yet the Bible says in John 20 that uh, he breathed on him and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, before uh, the ascension, you got the Holy Ghost and Christ gave him to you. But after the ascension, when you get the Holy Ghost, when you get saved. Look, here's what I was saying earlier about what he won't say. He shall not speak of himself. This is Christ teaching us about the Holy Spirit. He shall not speak of himself. He's a comforter. He's called. He's the paraclete. He's the one that comes alongside. Think of a, a hurt runner. And somebody comes alongside and gets on the hurt side and helps him cross the finish line. That's what the Holy Spirit does. You can't not cross the finish line if you're born again because the Holy Spirit is helping you cross the finish line. Okay? Know ye not that ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Uh, you know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. All right? Third thing, the sealing of the Holy Spirit. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Another place calls him the earnest. Okay, so twice he's called the seal, and once he's called the earnest. We're going to stop right there. All right, so Jeremy, you're going to help me remember that we're going to pick up on page 7. We talked about the three works of the Holy Ghost in salvation. We're going to start with the continual work of the Spirit. <clears throat> the Bible also calls the Holy Spirit earnest. Now, I know you've bought a house at some point, correct? You've bought a house at some point. What is earnest money? Honest. Earnest money. It's money you better have at the closing. <laughs> earnest money is actually money you have when you make an offer. 
I've never made an offer in my house, in on a house that didn't go with a check I handed to the realtor. Right. Here's twenty five hundred dollars. I'm gonna buy that house. I, I I can't write you a check for seventy, a hundred, whatever it was, but here's my it's earnest money. Payment. What? It's like a down payment. It's like a down payment. It's and in today's payment. American world, you actually get your earnest money back if things don't work out. But historically. You give the earnest money that says, I'm gonna buy that house if I can work it out. But you're saying you can have this money because I'm coming back for the house. And if you don't come back with the, the amount of money for all the house, that person gets to keep that money originally. God gave you the Holy Spirit. It's your earnest. You're going to go to heaven because you have the earnest of the Spirit. All right, any questions? Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for the those that came out today, and even though Danny had to leave, uh, I'm glad he got to come for a little bit. And Lord, I pray that you would bless and use us tomorrow. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, hold on.